never forget that in the process of devaluation, the narcissist converts you in his mind into a persecutory object, an enemy, from idealized to derealized, <laughs> devalued and then discarded. To reacquire you, to hover you, the narcissist must do two things. One, he must re-idealize you. He must Photoshop the snapshot of you in his mind so as to render you again an ideal maternal figure. But that's only half the work. The other half is to make sure that his hovering would end successfully because narcissists don't take kindly to failure and rejection. They're very fragile and vulnerable, even in black. <laughs> okay, Shoshanim. My name is Sam Vachnin, and I'm the author of Malignant Self Love Narcissism Revisited, a former visiting professor of psychology and currently on the faculty of CIAPS. And onward we move towards narcissistic probing. Narcissistic probing is a phrase that I've coined to describe, to describe the narcissist hesitant tests, probing, attempts to ascertain that the hoovering will work and that it won't end in a fiasco and the termination, the, the termination of the shared fantasy for good. Narcissistic probing. Narcissists attend therapy after collapse or mortification. And so there are people who say that clinical psychologists would regard narcissists as mostly vulnerable and covert, while psychology professors such as myself would regard narcissists as mostly grandiose and overt. But it is, of course, nonsense. It's the same narcissist. It's the same narcissist. The process of collapse exposes the vulnerable and fragile core of the narcissist. Every narcissist has a fragile, vulnerable core. Narcissism is 100% all the time, in all cases, no exception, compensatory. Narcissism, cognitive distortions such as grandiosity, they compensate for an inferiority complex for a bad object that keeps informing the narcissist how unworthy and inadequate he is, what a loser. And so the narcissist needs to compensate for this. Now, most of the time it works. Most of the time the narcissist is able to coerce people to provide him with narcissistic supply, to participate in his shared fantasies, to adulate him, to surround him with uh, luxurious, a luxurious lifestyle, money, sex, you name it, most of the time. But some of the time, the narcissist fails. He fails to extract narcissistic supply from his human environment. He fails to secure his goals on the way to obtaining supply. So he collapses. This is the collapsed narcissist. It is then that all the narcissistic defenses, the overt grandiose defenses, are disabled. It is then that they are deactivated, and this process is known as decompensation. And then, of course, having hit rock bottom, these narcissists attend therapy. <laughs> and so clinicians, people who work with narcissists as therapists, as psychiatrists, as psychologists, yes, it's true, they see the vulnerable underbelly of the narcissist and everyone else sees the overt and grandiose side but these are two sides of the same coin the, and all the self-styled experts including those with academic degrees are talking nonsense i'm sorry to say absolute nonsense i've uh, read an article in uh, the september edition of scientific american and only elsa ronningston made some sense. Everyone else there got it 100% wrong. 
and I'm not talking about the YouTubers, I'm talking about the so-called academic experts, who I've never heard of, by the way, most of them. Elsa Roningstam is definitely an expert on narcissism, a very famous one. So, why am I telling you this? Because the process of devaluation and discard exposes the narcissist's fragile, vulnerable underbelly. Remember that within the shared fantasy, the narcissist is a child, and you are the mother. You're the maternal figure. The narcissist needs to reenact with you early childhood conflicts which are unresolved. He needs to separate from you and become an individual. But you are still the mother. You are the adult in the room. And he's just a babe, a baby, an infant. So the narcissist feels throughout this process disempowered the way a baby does, the way an infant does. And then having devalued you and discarded you, he feels uncertain, vulnerable, fragile. He, in this sense, becomes covert, or the covert aspects of him become a lot more dominant than throughout the duration of the shared fantasy. The end of every shared fantasy. Every shared fantasy ends in devaluation and discard, period. This has nothing to do with you as an intimate partner, and there's nothing you can do about it. The very purpose of a shared fantasy is to convert you into a maternal figure so that the narcissist can dump you. End of story. But in the final stages of the shared fantasy, the narcissist faces enormous stresses and huge anxieties. Because the internal object in his mind that represents you is being transformed in ways which are essentially ominous, minacious ways, ways that threaten the equilibrium and the precarious balance of the narcissist's house of cards, aka personality. The narcissist also has to get rid of you, and the narcissist is a creature of habit. The narcissist risks a backlash or punitive measures by you, and the narcissist is a coward. In short, the period of devaluation and discard is not easy on the narcissist, and tends to push him to become more vulnerable, so he becomes more passive-aggressive, and then he becomes more aggressive, he becomes more envious, he becomes more malevolent, he becomes more scheming, he becomes, in short, a bit more psychopathic, secondary psychopathic. You remember, I keep saying that when the narcissist faces collapse, he becomes a bit of a borderline. He becomes emotionally dysregulated. He decompensates. He acts out. The same goes here. The devaluation discard process is the collapse of the shared fantasy. During this limited phase, the narcissist clinically is a collapsed narcissist and therefore exposing his borderline covert side for a short period of time, mind you. It could last a day, it could last a week, it could last a month. It's never long term. And it never comes to characterize the narcissist. It's just a phase that the narcissist is going through. But still, he changes. The devaluation discard, ironically, often changes the narcissist. This phase often changes the narcissist more than it changes you. And so, hoovering is an example of this hybridity, this combination of grandiosity and vulnerability. On the one hand, to believe that he is able to hover you, to develop the conviction that he can re-idealize you and you will come running back, that's grandiose, of course. That's cognitive distortion. In some cases, unfortunately, not in all. But it requires grandiosity. It requires the belief in one's own omnipotence and irresistibility. So there's this grandiose element in Hoovering. But Hoovering, Hoovering also contains a vulnerable element. Hoovering comes on the tail, on the tail end of devaluation and discard. At that phase, that stage, the narcissist is still self-mortified if you wish, or self-injured at least, and definitely self-collapsed. <clears throat> so the narcissist needs to make sure 
that he doesn't suffer yet another self-inflicted narcissistic injury by being rejected by you. If the narcissist attempts to hover you and you reject him, that's narcissistic injury. If you reject him in public, in a shaming way, that's narcissistic mortification. That's something the narcissist does not want to go through, especially, especially having lived through, having endured the collapse of the shared fantasy. Admittedly, the collapse of the shared fantasy was brought on was brought on by the narcissist himself. It is, as I said, self-inflicted. The narcissist made it happen. It didn't have to happen. The narcissist made it happen because of his compulsion to separate and individuate. But still, it's a collapse. The end, the end of any shared fantasy, the terminal phase, is a collapse. The narcissist is vulnerable because he is clinically, has been rendered a collapsed narcissist. So he can't take the risk of another narcissistic injury, rejection, mockery, humiliation, shame, mortification. He can't take this risk. He needs to make sure that if he were to attempt to hover you, he would say yes, and not just any yes, what, is called, what we call enthusiastic consent, a resounding yes. Narcissists generally, even overt and grandiose ones, or maybe especially, overt and grandiose ones, cannot countenance rejection. They're hypersensitive to rejection. That's why they develop cold empathy in order to scan for possible, uh, for possible, for people who possibly could put them down or take them down. That's why they are hypervigilant, all the time scanning for insults and slights and interpreting even the most innocuous behavior and innocent remarks as a form of attack. It's all because they have to protect the vulnerable, fragile, delusional, dis cognitively distorted core that is known as narcissism. That's the only form of true narcissism. Anything that doesn't, anything that is not vulnerable, anything that is not fragile, that's psychopathy. That's not narcissism. So, narcissists, real narcissists, true narcissists, cannot countenance rejection. Rejection terrifies. They need to make sure of the outcomes of the hovering and to resolve any cognitive dissonance that may arise. And so, they probe. They probe. They collect data. They gather, they gather information. They test you in small ways and big. They surround you. They create an environment in which, which resembles a laboratory where your minutest behaviors and speech acts and words and writings are interpreted ad nauseum. I call it the hermeneutic lab. So this is probing. Now, lab bombing, for example, is a form of probing. Grooming is a form of probing. Love bombing is intended to condition you, of course, to shape you via operant conditioning, to, to render you um, docile, subservient, submissive, intimate partner who is in love with herself, with her idealized image through the narcissist's gaze. Yes, it's all true. And grooming is intended to condition you to behave in specific ways which would uphold the narcissist's inflated, fantastic self-image and allow the shared fantasy to unfold the way the narcissist wants it to, with you as a maternal figure. So love bombing and grooming have many, many crucial functions. But one of the functions of love bombing and grooming is to test you, to see whether you're going to fit into the shared fantasy, whether you're going to fulfill your maternal role appropriately, whether you're going to accept and love the narcissist unconditionally, regardless of his misconduct and misbehavior. In short, love bombing and grooming are a testing phase, a probing phase. So these are examples of narcissistic probing. Narcissistic abuse itself is a form of probing. The first phase of narcissistic abuse is intended to answer the question, will she love me 
unconditionally as a mother would. Now remember, he and she are interchangeable. The half of all narcissists are women, so just change the gender, gender pronouns. So we're beginning to see that many of the narcissist's behaviors, which are attributed to the narcissist's grandiosity, coercive nature, antisocial impulses, many of these behaviors actually emanate from insecurity. The narcissist's profound sense of insecurity. Because the narcissist has an internal image as a bad object, and because he compensates for it by projecting a false self, a facade, acting, faking, the narcissist is very insecure. He knows what he's doing. Narcissists are self-aware. Don't let any self-styled expert tell you otherwise. They're definitely self-aware. And so they tend to be hypervigilant. They develop paranoid ideation, the secretary ideation. They test people all the time. They trust no one. But they trust no one because everyone and his dog is an opportunity for pain, for hurt. Anyone and everyone can reject the narcissist, humiliate the narcissist, criticize the narcissist, disagree with the narcissist, shame the narcissist in private or in public. Everyone is a potential for hurt, for harm. So the narcissist needs to neutralize these incipient, ambient threats, potential threats, by gathering intelligence. Think of it as a CIA, <laughs> one-man CIA. So love bombing and grooming, narcissistic abuse, they're all forms of testing your mettle, verifying, making sure what you're made of and how you're going to behave in a variety of extreme conditions. The narcissist also probes via third parties, especially in the hovering phase, when he is not sure of the outcomes. Having rejected you, having abandoned you, having devalued you, having discarded you, having shamed you, having humiliated you, <laughs> the narcissist cannot be sure of your response to his attempts to re-idealize you and reacquire you as a participant and a playmate in a shared fantasy. He cannot be sure. You may tell him to F off, naturally, as you should do. So he uses third parties, flying monkeys, in various settings in order to collect information. Are you predisposed to take him back? Would you be positively reactive to any attempt to hover you? Um, do you miss the shared fantasy and the narcissist? So there's a lot of information gathering going on through third parties. You won't believe who the narcissist recruits. Your dearest and closest friends, family members, people you've trusted all your life, they are converted by the narcissist and they become the narcissist's eyes and ears and surveillance and listening devices. And you're surrounded, you're besieged by extensions of the narcissist. And the information flows back. The narcissist analyzes it, contextualizes it, and decides whether you are hovering material or not. Similarly, the narcissist stalks you on social media, of course, using anonymous accounts, fake accounts, and sometimes his own accounts, <laughs> if he doesn't care. So he gets, he gathers a lot of, of relevant info through social media. Be careful. Keep your private life private. Don't overshare. Coming to think of it, don't share at all. Convert your accounts to private accounts. Reject all kinds of friend requests. I mean, there's a period after the devaluation and the discard where, by the way, that's the, the most frequent period where hoovering is the most frequent. Hoovering is most frequent almost immediately after devaluation and discard, believe it or not. So there's this period of, I don't know, six months, one year, two years, three years, maybe, where you are very open to intrus intrusive attempts to gather data about you and then to deploy this data, to manipulate it and to abuse it or misuse it in order to coerce you or 
cajole you or convince you or persuade you to join a new shared fantasy where again you would be the queen idealized but you will be the queen mother and again of course this shared fantasy 2.0 is going to end up the same way evaluation discard separation individuation and so on and so forth so immediately after the evaluation and discard and for a period i would say minimum period of two years you should be very vigilant very careful because the narcissist is all over you having ever devalued you having abandoned you having rejected you having team teamed up already with a new partner in the throes of another shared fantasy the narcissist is still over all over you inside his mind you introject the internal object that represents you is still inside his mind and still this object is still tormenting him because it used to be ideal now it is an enemy now it is persecutory and it tortures him from the inside the only way the only way to restore inner peace is to match you with the internal object either as an enemy and then the narcissist would push your boundaries and force you to become an enemy or as a re-idealized intimate partner and that's hoovering narcissist can hoover you as an enemy it's a common mistake online the narcissist hoovers you because he needs to reconcile you the external object with the internal object that represents you so if you refuse to become an intimate partner in a new shared fantasy the narcissist would do his best to convert you into a true enemy he would stalk you he would threaten you he would attack you he would spy on you he would he would uh, try to destroy your life he would do anything and everything for you to become a real active enemy and then he is at peace because he can reconcile this with the devalued the secretary object in his mind so to attain inner peace the narcissist needs you post devaluation and discard narcissist needs you in the aftermath to become either an enemy or again an intimate partner there's no middle ground and he's going to try to re-idealize you and hoover you one way but then if he fails he will hoover you as an enemy and that is something much neglected in everything i've heard online and by the way in the literature hoovering you as an enemy so it would explain many of the behaviors that you you've come across i'm sure with a narcissist and narcissists can of course oscillate vacillate between the two one day you are a potential intimate partner and you're ideal and you're wonderful and you're beautiful and you're amazing and so on and the next day you're the enemy and you're hateful and you're vengeful and you've destroyed his life and it's all your fault and the next and the day after again you are an ideal so the narcissist attempts simultaneously to probe both possibilities directly with you in a channel of communication and at the same time always through third parties social media and indirect intelligence gathering he consults other people he consults other people about you he collects all the information from your social media accounts he may impersonate people and call your bank or your work or your workplace it can get really bad if you don't collaborate with the narcissist in settling the internal object the narcissist can and does become antisocial to the point of acting criminally identity theft and so on and so forth so your best bet is actually not to reject the narcissist hoovering attempts outright i mean first you go no contact of course but if a narcissist insists on contact i am not of the opinion that you should be contrarian and adverse and uh, act with animosity and hostility and fend, fend him off and so on and so forth as if you don't collaborate with the hoovering efforts one way or another he's going to settle on a version of you which would compel him 
to act in ways which could be detrimental to your personal safety, uh, career, and family. So the way to react to a narcissist hoovering is to be firm with your boundaries, but not aggressive. To say, I've moved on, I have a, a, another life now, and I wish you all the best, and so on. So to be firm. But at that particular phase, to communicate. Now, you don't need to extend the communication and don't fall in the trap of the narcissist attempts to recreate some portions of the shared fantasy. You just keep repeating, these are my boundaries and I will not relent. Having communicated this two or three times, go no contact again. 